Dr. Bach, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be asked to speak here. I, I feel a little out of place with all of the uh, distinguished speakers that you've had. From, I was listening to my curriculum vitae, and <clears throat> I think the one thing I got out of it is that I'm a Hoosier. I'm going to uh, discuss today the medical uses of the abused drugs, and this of necessity gets into the field of pharmacology because we must consider the, um, the actions that these drugs have on the human body and the organ systems. <clears throat> when I was going over my material, I realized how lengthy it was. I've had a problem of condensing and recondensing, and when I finally looked at the draft of my discussion, I was reminded of the story of the little boy that went into the library and asked the librarian for a book on turtles. And she looked around and find her, found a very fine textbook <coughs> devoted to nothing but turtles. She gave it to the little boy and he went on his way. And the following week he came back and returned the book. And she asked him, Billy, how did you like the book on turtles? And he said, without any hesitation, I didn't like it. And she said, well, what was wrong? And he said, well, it told me too much about turtles. And I hope that you folks don't feel that way after I get through today. But um, I am going to discuss, discuss these agents from a medical standpoint and a pharmacological standpoint. Basically, I'm going to uh, discuss four groups of drugs. The first are the narcotic analgesics. <clears throat> The second group that we will discuss will be the hypnotics and sedatives. The third group will be the stimulants. And then, as time allows, the fourth group will, will be the tranquilizers and drugs used in psychotherapy. <coughs> an analgesic is an agent that is capable of allevi alleviating or relieving pain. And the first group are the narcotic analgesics. <coughs> Among the remedies which has pleased Almighty God to give man to relieve his suffering, none is so universal and so efficacious as morphine. <clears throat> These were the words of Sydenham in 1680. Morphine, the alkaloid that gives opium its analgesic action, remains a standard against which new analgesics are measured. The word opium itself is derived from the Greek name for juice. Arabian physicians introduced this compound, uh, or opium, into the Orient um, during their trading ventures, and it was employed first in the Orient in the control of dysentery. <clears throat> in 1803, a physician by the name of Sir Turner isolated and described opium, uh, an opium alkaloid that he named morphine after Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. The psychological effects of opium have been known for um, since ancient times, and the early Greek physicians recognized uh, the ability of these drugs to produce physical and psychological dependence. Nevertheless, it was not until the 18th century that opium smoking uh, became popular in the Orient. The problem of opium eating, or the actual drinking of laudanum, never became as prevalent or as socially destructive as the abuse of alcohol. However, the invention of the hypodermic needle tended to produce a more severe variety of addiction than smoking. And it is the recognition of this that has stimulated a search throughout uh, recent times for an analgesic that would uh, be effective and would not produce addiction. And this search has not yet ended. As you have been informed, I'm sure opium is obtained from the milky exudate of the capsule of the poppy plant Papaver somniferum. <clears throat> it pharmacologically has several constituents which are called alkaloids, and there are two groups of these. There are only a few medically used alkaloids, however. The main ones uh, in the group that we're considering are morphine, codeine, papaverine, and noscopine. The latter two I don't think you need to concern yourself with at all. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I uh, had some slides and I did not correspond properly and they can't project them for me, but I did want to show you the structure briefly of morphine and uh, merely to illustrate that it can be changed very simply into codeine or heroin 
or hydromorphone or other compounds. Morphine and similar alkaloids produce their major effects on the central nervous system and bowel. <clears throat> Morphine affects the nervous system by a narcotic action manifested by analgesia, drowsiness, changes in mood, and mental clouding. A significant feature of the analgesia is that it occurs before and often without sleep. Euphoria, or the sense of well-being, is frequently experienced as a result of the relief of pain. In contrast, when morphine is given to a normal individual, his reactions are not always pleasant. <clears throat> there may be mild anxiety and fear, and frequently, frequently there is nausea and vomiting. Morphine produces mental cloudiness and inability to concentrate lessened physical uh, activity and lethargy. The recently required learned responses are first affected. The face and especially the nose may itch and the mouth is dry. Dreams are prominent. The psychological effects outlast the analgesic effects by several hours. <clears throat> In some patients, the vomiting induced by morphine is not associated with the usual unpleasant emotional reaction and because of this, addicts refer to this as the good sick. <clears throat> the relief of pain is an interesting aspect of morphine, uh, in that morphine does not affect the other modalities, such as touch, vibration, vision, and hearing. Indeed, the perception of the painful stimulus itself is not always decreased. There is instead an altered reaction to the painful stimulus. Patients frequently report that the pain is still present, but they feel more comfortable. Continuous dull pain is relieved more effectively than sharp intermittent pain, but sufficient amounts often relieve even the severe pain associated with gallbladder, colic, or the passage of kidney stones. The mechanism of action of morphine as an analgesic is still not known. It is difficult to differentiate between the original painful sensation and the reaction to the painful sensation. The experimental measurements of the effects of morphine on pain threshold alone have not always been consistent. But by contrast, moderate dosages of morphine are quite effective in relieving clinical pain. A patient's ability to tolerate pain may be markedly increased even when the capacity to perceive the sensation may be relatively unaltered. However, it would be an oversimplification to describe all the analgesic changes to the reactive component to pain, as drugs such as the barbiturates and meprobamate are quite effective in relieving anxiety and yet do not produce any analgesia except in grossly intoxicating doses. The pupil of the eye is markedly affected by morphine, the effect being constriction. In morphine poisoning, the pupillary constriction is marked, is marked and pinpoint pupils are diagnostic. Tolerance to the pupillary effects of morphine are not prominent, and morphine addicts continue to show small pupils. Morphine is a primary respiratory depressant. In large doses of morphine, patients can breathe with instructions, but to do so without instructions, they may not. They may just fail to breathe. This indifference to respiration may account in part for the usefulness of these agents in pulmonary edema and in other situations in which the patient's struggle to breathe aggravates the basic pathology. <clears throat> morphine and related narcotic analgesics depress the cough reflex. At least a part of this effect is due to direct action on the cough center in the medulla of the brain. Propulsive peristaltic waves in the colon are diminished or abolished by morphine, and the tone of the anal sphincter is greatly augmented. There is in inattention to the normal sensory stimulus or the defecation reflex. <clears throat> Therapeutic doses of morphine, codeine, and other morphine derivatives can cause a marked increase in biliary tract pressure. This is in the pressure in the uh, biliary tree uh, draining the liver. The rise in pressure is responsible for the pancreatitis and biliary spasms sometimes seen after the introduction of morphine. 
Morphine also affects the ureter and urinary bladder, producing urinary retention. Administration of large doses of morphine may prolong labor and increase infant mortality, and therapeutic doses may somewhat prolong labor. <clears throat> large doses of morphine cause bronchial constriction, and for this reason, morphine is used with great caution in people who suffer from bronchial asthma. Morphine in dilates the cutaneous blood vessels, and this effect is responsible for the sweating and itching seen with morphine administration. The main route of administration of morphine is by the hypodermic needle, but it can be absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. <clears throat> The relief of pain is the primary indication for the use of narcotics such as morphine. No patient should ever wish for death because of his physician's reluctance to use adequate amounts of potent analgesics. However, narcotics should not be used until non-narcotic agents no longer give relief. In the relief of cough, the dose of a given narcotic required to depress cough seems to be lower than that required to produce analgesia. The use of morphine in the uh, alleviation of cough is very limited because of its addictive properties, so that codeine has been the primary narcotic used in the, in the relief of cough. I might say here that uh, the only therapeutic use that I've ever known of that heroin was put to was in the relief of cough, and uh, it has been withdrawn from the market. I'm told from older physicians that it was, it was fine for relieving cough. One of the oldest indications for the use of morphine is in the treatment of exhausting diarrhea and dysentery. As in the treatment of cough, the dosage is much less of any given opiate, and uh, the usual opiates used are, are uh, opium tinctures and paragoric. Now, another narcotic analgesic is meperidine, or Demerol. It is a synthetic analgesic introduced in 1939. It is chemically dissimilar to morphine, and for a long time it was thought to be free of many of morphine's undesirable properties. The chief analgesic action of Demerol is on the central nervous system. In spite of its structural dissimilarity to morphine, it has many similarities, and it is presumed that its mechanism of action is the same as that of morphine. The duration of action is shorter, being about two to four hours. The respiratory depression resulting from Demerol is the same in degree to that of morphine in comparable doses. Demerol does not affect the pupil. <clears throat> Demerol may produce spasm in the biliary tract, but in equal doses with morphine, the spasmogenic effect is not as pronounced. It is therefore commonly used in renal colic, and biliary colic. <clears throat> uh, Demerol does not seem to have a significant value in the treatment of diarrhea. Late in pregnancy, the drug does not significantly alter the activity of the normally contracting uterus, and this um, accounts for its use in obstetrical analgesia. <clears throat> Side effects occur with Demerol, including dizziness, sweating, euphoria, dry mouth, nausea, vomiting, weakness, visual disturbances, palpitation, faintness, and sedation. The duration of action of, of Demerol is considered shorter than that of morphine, and this may account for the slower development of tolerance to meperidine. The pattern of withdrawal differs somewhat from that of morphine in that there is less autonomic effect sweating and unpleasant uh, nausea, etc. And the symptoms develop more rapidly and are of shorter duration. Interestingly enough, a higher percentage of doctors and nurses become addicts to meperidine than to other agents. In summary, except for the usefulness in cough and diarrhea, morphine differs little from Demerol. Um, another compound that is worthy of brief mention is methadone, M-E-T-H-A-D-O-N-E. -E. This is a narcotic analgesic. The, it remotely resembles morphine in its structure <coughs> and in its pharmacological properties. 
It is more effective when given orally. Its duration of action is longer. And in the field of drug addiction, it has been used in the withdrawal state in that fewer doses seem to be necessary in a given 24-hour period. Another group of abused drugs are the antitussives, or the drugs used for the relief of cough. A number of cough depressant drugs are available, most of them acting centrally through mechanisms that are not entirely clear. These include most of the narcotic analgesics as well as a number of nar non-narcotic agents. It is true that opiate addicts who cannot obtain their drug of choice and occasionally adolescents seeking new experiences often turn to cough preparations containing opiates or to paragoric. It is more significant that although these preparations are extensively used and readily available without prescription, the number of persons who have become psychologically dependent on opiates as a result of using this type of preparation is exceedingly small. The non-narcotic antitussives have no significant abuse liability. The only one uh, that is in common use is a drug called Romilar, and I understand from my daughter that some of her close friends have been using it to get their kicks. Now, the second group of drugs that I wish to discuss with you are the hypnotics and sedatives, and the barbiturates are the main group of drugs in this area. The only sleep-producing drugs known to phys physicians for centuries were alcohol, opium, and belladonna. Today, many hundreds of compounds capable of producing sleep are available. Most of these sed sedative hypnotic agents are general depressants. They depress a wide range of cellular functions. Hypnotic drugs tend to resemble one another with respect to their differential action on various functions, so that much of what is said of the barbiturates is true of the other hypnotic drugs. Barbituric acid results from the condensation of malonic acid and urea and was first prepared in 1864 by Adolf von Bayer. There are several stories about the origin of the term barbituric acid. For example, it is said that Bayer celebrated the occasion of the synthesis of a new compound by visiting a nearby tavern frequented by artillery officers. It happened that it was the day of St. Barbara, the patron saint of artillery officers, and in the ensuing festivities, Barbara was amalgamated with urea to give the new compound its name. According to another story, the new compound was named in honor of a Munich mistress. Barbituric acid is not itself a central nervous system depressant. The derivatives of barbituric acid are called barbiturates and, are fre and frequently have hypnotic potency. The first hypnotic barbiturate, barbital, or diethylbarbituric acid, was introduced into medicine in 1903 under the name of Viranol. The second oldest barbiturate is phenobarbital, which was introduced into therapeutics in 1912. It was uh, marketed under the name of luminol. Phenobarbital has properties not shared by other commonly used barbiturates, which, make, which makes it especially useful as an anticonvulsant as well as a sedative. It is one of the most valuable central nervous system depressants that we have. More than 2,500 barbiturates have been synthesized. Approximately 50 have been marketed for clinical use. The um, barbiturates that are lipid soluble, that are uh, soluble in the fatty tissues of the body, are the ones who, that are associated with a decreased duration of action, action a decrease in latency of onset of activity, more rapid metabolic degradation, and often increased hypnotic potency. Now, all this means is that if the barbiturate is soluble in fat, it goes to work quickly, and it has a short duration of action. If it is less soluble in fat, it does not act as quickly, and it does not, uh, and it does stay around longer. And this solubility in fat is called the partition coefficient. 
As a result of this, barbiturates vary a great deal in their length of action. The shorter acting ones are used as anesthetic agents. The longest acting uh, is represented by phenobarbital. These drugs are general depressants. They depress the activity of nerves, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. They reduce oxygen consumption. They are cap capable of depressing a wide range of biological functions. <clears throat> the central nervous system is exquisitely sensitive to barbiturates. <coughs> there is a decrease in the energy yielding reactions in the brain. They also interfere somehow with the process by which stored energy is utilized. It is the latter effect that accounts for their therapeutic action. <clears throat> It is interesting that barbiturates applied locally to nervous tissue display a local anesthetic action, but this particular action has not been put into therapeutic use. The sedation from barbiturates ranges all the way from mild sedation to deep coma. The degree of depression obtained depends not only on the particular barbiturate, but the dose and the route of administration and also the degree of excitability of the nervous system at the time of administration. It also depends on the degree of tolerance uh, induced by former experience with the drug. <clears throat> In most respects, barbiturate-induced sleep resembles physiological sleep. However, sleep is a more complex phenomenon than is commonly realized. For example, during physiological sleep, there are slight cyclic changes in state involving periodic episodes characterized by rapid eye movements, relatively high frequency EEG activity, regular movements of the extremities, <clears throat> and a sharp decrease in muscle tension along with dreams. Barbiturates reduce the amount of time spent in the rapid eye movement phase of sleep. And in this respect, at least barbiturate induced sleep differs from psychological sleep. It has been claimed by some investigators that deprivation of this phase of sleep may have deleterious psychological effects. <clears throat> if sleep is not followed by the introdu introduction of barbiturates, the patient may show signs of euphoria or confusion resembling those of alcoholic inebriation. In the presence of severe pain, barbiturates may cause delirium. There may be a hangover, particularly when the long-acting compounds are employed. And even when there is no hangover, mental impairment can be demonstrated for hours after awakening if proper testing is carried out. <clears throat> the barbiturates, unlike the gaseous anesthetics, lack significant ability to relieve the sense of pain without definite impairment of consciousness. Indeed, in small doses, the barbiturates increase the reaction to painful stimuli. However, they are not without value in affording relief of pain in certain clinical situations. Furthermore, the barbiturates seem to enhance the analgesic action of aspirin and other analgesics. But taken by themselves, the barbiturates cannot be relied upon to produce sleep in the presence of severe pain. In anesthetic doses, all the clinically employed barbiturates are capable of inhibiting convulsions. However, phenobarbital has a selective anticonvulsant action. The action is unrelated to sedation since non-sedative doses are often effective. The reason for the anti-epileptic action of phenobarbital in small doses is not known. Barbiturates are also respiratory depressants. They only slightly depress protective reflexes, such as the cough reflex. <clears throat> the barbiturates cross the placental barrier and are taken up by the fetus. This particular fact accounts for the limited use of the barbiturates for anesthesia during labor and delivery. <clears throat> The tolerance to barbiturates does occur, and in part this is due to the action of the barbiturates on enzyme systems in the liver. Barbiturates activate enzymes in the liver which are responsible for their own metabolism and degradation. Also, the 
development of tolerance uh, occurs in the central nervous system by, uh, adap uh, by adaptation. Barbiturates have re acquired a popular rep reputation as addicting drugs. This reputation has been fostered and exploited by promoters of new non-barbiturate hypnotics. However, the barbiturates do not differ from other potent sedative hypnotic drugs in this respect. The high incidence of barbiturate addiction probably reflects simply the wide use of the drugs and their lack of unpleasant side effects. <clears throat> barbiturates are marketed in a bewildering array of preparations, often in mixtures with other drugs, with bromides, tranquilizers, analgesics, belladonna alkaloids, xanthines, antihistamines, vitamins, antibiotics, digestive enzymes, gastric antacids, and absorbents. In the United States, phenobarbital is an ingredient in at least 80 different proprietary medications. Barbiturates may be obtained as powders, elixirs, syrups, drops, capsules, tablets, sustained release forms, and coated tablets. <clears throat> the danger of severe physical dependence on barbiturates, I believe, is overemphasized. <clears throat> These drugs are still regarded as excellent remedies for the production of sedation and tranquility and are useful in anxiety and tension states, in essential high blood pressure, nausea or vomiting of functional origin, heart failure, pyloric spasm in infants, croup, and whooping cough. They may be employed in acute alcoholic states and in the treatment of withdrawal symptoms, and they may en enhance the analgesics. Because of the anticonvulsant activity, they are used in the treatment of tetanus, eclampsia, epilepsy, and cerebral hemorrhage. They are also effective in combating convulsions caused by strychnine, cocaine, and other local anesthetic anesthetics. Miscellaneous applications include medications prior to anesthesia, and the production of tranquility necessary for the healing of peptic ulcers and certain afflictions of the large bowel. Despite all of this, uh, these wonderful uses for barbiturates, the non-narcotic hypnotics have been developed, or the non-barbiturate hypnotics have been developed, and um, their use is quite widespread. This group, as a large group of compounds with, other diver with otherwise diverse clinical properties, which have in common the ability to produce depression of the central nervous system. They share the disadvantages of barbiturates, but less is known about their pharmacology and toxicology. With few exceptions, there is little difference between central depressant action of the various hypnotic drugs, except in the duration of action and in the amount required to produce the desired effect. However, um, because they're here, or have been, I think they're worthy of a brief discussion. The first of these was, was bromide, and it was first utilized in 1857 to treat epilepsy. In the latter half of the 19th century, bromides were used on an enormous scale. Bromide has been supplanted in modern therapeutics, however, by less toxic agents but is still used occasionally for the treatment of grand mal and focal epilepsy. It is still found in nostrums, nerve tonics, and headache remedies. The main danger of administration is chronic intoxication. This is characterized by mental disturbances, impaired memory, drowsiness, dizziness, emotional disturbances, delirium, hallucinations, and coma. Also, there is the so-called bromide rash, which is a manifestation of chronic bromism. Another of the non-barbiturate hypnotics is chloral hydrate. It is a sedative and hypnotic. It has been employed along with alcohol as the so-called knockout drop. It is locally irritating to the skin and has been used in certain liniments. Chloral hydrate has little analgesic activity, and excitement and delirium may occur. Its most wide use has been as an hypnotic agent, particularly in elderly patients, and in the treatment of alcoholic withdrawal syndrome, delirium tremens. 
Another former popular, popular agent was peraldehyde. It was introduced into medicine in 1882. This drug decomposes into two toxic um, substances, acetaldehyde and acetic acid. This occurs on standing, and there have been cases of poisoning with fatality due to administration of deteriorated peraldehyde. It is somewhat more potent than chloral hydrate. It has been used in the emergency treatment of tetanus, eclampsia, epilepsy, and in poisoning by convulsant drugs. It also has been used in the, in the treatment of the withdrawal state from, alco uh, from alcoholism and in other psychiatric states. Now, other sedative hypnotics you, in use today that I'm sure you've heard of are meprobamate or equinil or miltown, carbomal, glutethamide or doradin, methoprylon or naludar, and chlordiazepoxide or librium. All of these drugs share many of the undesired properties of barbiturates, but have been introduced as non-barbiturate hypnotics and sedatives and are widely used today. Now a brief mention of the stimulants. The first is cocaine. This is derived from the trees of Peru and Bolivia and has been used for centuries by the natives there to increase endurance. The most important clinical action is the ability of co cocaine to block nerve conduction on local application, and formerly it was widely used as a local anesthetic. Its most striking systemic effect is stimulation of the central nervous system. The first recognizable action is manifested by agitation, restlessness, and excitement. There is some evidence that mental powers are increased and there be, may be an increase in the capacity for muscular work, probably due to lessened sense of fatigue. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's famous Sherlock Holmes took advantage of the central effects of cocaine, much to the perturbation of poor Dr. Watson. Cocaine has largely been replaced in the many fields of local anesthesia by such agents as procaine, novocaine, and xylocaine. Because of its addictive potency, cocaine is included among the drugs whose use is controlled by the federal narcotic regulations. Another central nervous system stimulant with potential of addictive qualities and physical dependence is amphetamine. It is a powerful central nervous system stimulant. <clears throat> its central nervous system stimul stimulating effects predominate, and amphetamine has thus made found a useful place in the treatment of a disease called narcolepsy, which is a disease characterized by an altered sleep pattern. It is also used in the treatment of obesity, fatigue, Parkinsonism, and in, and in poisoning by central nervous system depressants. It is effective after all administration, and its effect lasts for hours. Psychic effects seem to depend on the dose and the state and the mental state of the patient. Main results are wakefulness, alertness, and decreased sense of fatigue. There is an elevation of mood, increased initiative, confidence, and ability to concentrate. Performance of simple mental tasks is improved, although more work and although more work may be accomplished, the number of errors is not necessarily decreased. Physical performance in athletes is improved. However, the above effects may be reversed by overdosage or repeated dosage. Prolonged use of large doses are always followed by mental depression and fatigue. Many individuals experience palpitation, dizziness, vasomotor disturbances, agitation, confusion, apprehension, and ultimately fatigue. Therefore, the amphetamine should not be used indiscriminately. Amphetamines seem to depress the appetite and have been widely used in the treatment of obesity. In dogs, weight loss rather promptly occurs with the introduction of amphetamines. The weight loss in dogs is almost entirely due to a re reduced food intake. 
and only in small measure to increased metabolism. There is in man some loss of acuity of smell and taste, and physical activity in man may be increased, contributing to the loss of weight that is seen in man. Amphetamines have little effect in reducing food take in those persons whose overeating is impelled by psychological factors. Addiction often occurs. Tolerance almost invariably develops, uh, particularly to the effect on the appetite. But a, withdraw a period of withdrawal will restore sensitivity. <clears throat> Now, the last group of drugs that I wish to discuss, and it will be very briefly, are the tranquilizers. I think that I should say a word first about um, the treatment of psychiatric disorders in general. Drugs have found their way into the most analytically oriented practices of psychiatry and into the general practice of medicine. They are used on a grand scale to change attitudes and emotions of patients, and in this connection, they are often abused. During the ninth, uh, before the 20th century, little was known about the pathophysiology of somatic disease and even less about mental disease, so that remedies were largely effective on a psychological basis. Prescriptions were exceedingly complex and consisted mostly of inert ingredients. During the 19th century, the, the development of the science of chemistry made possible the discovery of agents with relatively specific effects upon the central nervous system. These included anesthetic agents such as ether and nitrous oxide and the development of sedatives and hypnotics previously discussed. However, until the mid-1950s, there was little real progress in psychopharmacology. The influence of Sigmund Freud upon the psychotherapy of neurotic disorders became widespread early in the century and persists to this day. Other modes of treatment of psychological disorders besides verbal communication in, in the past included isolation and restraint, hydrotherapy, brain surgery, brain stimulation, and convulsive therapy. Drugs have largely supplanted these modalities of treatment with the exceptions of convulsive therapy and verbal communication. And drugs require no special technical skill or equipment for administration, and post-treatment complications are fewer. They are cheaper, they may be used in children and in the el elderly with relative ease, and they may be given during the course of psychotherapy. However, drug treatment of psy in psychiatry is still primarily empirical because the pathophysiology of psychiatric disorders has not been determined. The usefulness of many compounds in the treatment of the psychiatric disorders was discovered by chance in patients while being administered drugs for other purposes. One of the most difficult problems in psychiatry is the assessment of therapy. One must somehow answer the question whether the patient is improved after treatment and whether the improvement is due to the treatment. Drugs have the virtue over other forms of therapy that they are discrete materials that can be measured and easily dispensed in a controlled fashion. The other modes of therapy cannot be evaluated in this manner. Drugs also have stimulated investigators to become more concerned about scientific methodology and in the need for proper control. Double-blind procedures have been widely uh, applied to drug experiments. Now, among the, uh, the, the drugs used for psychiatric disorders, we have the major tranquilizers and the minor tranquilizers. And, uh, the epitome of the major tranquilizers is found in the phenothiazine group of drugs. That's P-H-E-N-O-T-H-I-A-Z-I-N-E. Dorland's Medical Dictionary, the 22nd edition in 1952, defined phenothiazine as a compound used in treating livestock for parasitic worms. Phenothiazine was synthesized in 1883 and came into use as a worm medication, a urinary antiseptic, and an insecticide. In 1950, for the first time, promethazine, 
Aphenothiazine was tried in the treatment of motor agitation and mental disease. In 1950, that same year, chlorpromazine or thorazine was synthesized. Variations in the phenothiazine molecule have resulted in compounds of different potency and toxicity from chlorpromazine, but the superiority of one over the other has yet to be demonstrated. Because chlorpromazine is the original and model of all the phenothiazines, I wish to discuss only its pharmacological actions. Thorazine produces a considerable degree of sedation, but tolerance develops rather rapidly to the sedative actions. <clears throat> In animals, chlorpromazine impairs the ability to make a conditioned response. For example, to respond to a learned auditory cue which signals the onset of a punishing shock which they can avoid by climbing a pole. Unlike, under the influences of small doses of thorazine, animals ignore the signal but still are able to escape by climbing the pole once the shock has been applied. This test and its variations have become the basis for a commonly used screening procedure for tranquilizer drugs. <clears throat> Indifference to environmental stimuli and consequent taming are easily seen in naturally aggressive animals. However, the taming effect is not characteristic only of the phenothiazines, but can be produced by barbiturates, narcotics, meprobamate, and Librium. <clears throat> Phenothiazines have little effect on respiration. However, in toxic doses, they are respiratory depressants. <coughs> Thorazine produces a marked protective action against the effects of apomorphine, a drug used to induce nausea and vomiting. And this antiemetic effect of chlorpromazine was uh, its original use, and it was marketed in the marketed in this country as an anti-emetic. It also has slight antihistaminic effects. Chlorpromazine has effects on the endocrine system. It blocks ovulation, suppresses estrous cycle, causes infertility and pseudopregnancy, and induces lactation. It also depresses testicular weight. It interferes with growth perhaps by in inhibiting the secretion of pituitary growth hormone. There are no characteristic effects on the liver by Thorazine except for a peculiar hypersensitivity reaction which results in a form of jaundice. <clears throat> Phenothiazines do not appear to be addic addictive. The sense of well-being that seems to be necessary for the development of psychological dependence is lacking and craving does not develop. However, some degree of physical dependence to these drugs may occur. Phenothiazines are remarkably safe agents. The incidence of side effects is less than 3%. The drugs have a high safety ratio and may be used over a wide range of dosage. The most dangerous reactions are the hypersensitivity reactions, particularly the blood disorders, jaundice, and skin disorders. There are other toxic reactions, such as a state resembling Parkinsonism, which may be produced by these drugs. They also produce orthostatic hypotension, or a fall in blood pressure in the upright position. There may be inhibition of ejaculation, usually without interference with orgasm. There has been described an abnormal pigmentation when high doses are given over a long period of time to schizophrenics. The primary therapeutic use of chlorpromazine is in the treatment of the major psychoses. It exerts a quieting effect on excited or hyperactive psychotic patients. Clouding of consciousness does not occur with conventional doses. Some patients are so benefited by the drug that psychopathology is not detectable even by highly skilled observers. There is considerable evidence that discharged psychotic patients maintained on phenothiazines have a lower incidence of rehospitalization. Many investigators now feel that schizophrenic patients should be continued on the drug for an indefinite period. 
Phenothiazines are also frequently prescribed for the treatment of the minor neurotic disorders, particularly anxiety. They are particularly useful in the very elderly and the very young. <clears throat> Chlorpromazine prevents vomiting in a variety of conditions, including uremia, cancer, radiation sickness, and the vomiting caused by a number of drugs. Also, the nausea and vomiting of pregnancy may be ameliorated by this compound. The control of intractable hiccups is another of its useful effects. Now, the minor tranquilizers or other tranquilizers include meprobamate, as mentioned before, this is Milltown or Equinel, Librium, and Valium. These are all widely used among the medical profession for the treatment of anxiety and tension and in the relaxation of skeletal muscle. Also, the combating of alcoholism is sometimes an indication for their use. Meprobamate is widely used in the treatment of anxiety, but the reason for its current popularity is not well understood. It has a definite sedative action in both animals and man. It shares many of the therapeutic effects of the barbiturates, and among these is an anticonvulsant effect. It has also been advocated as a muscle re relaxant. Valium shares many of the actions of meprobamate. Therapeutic uses of these compounds include the treatment of anxiety and the treatment of alcoholics, particularly for the alleviation of symptoms of alcoholic withdrawal or the excited and combative episodes that occur during alcoholic intoxication. I think I'll conclude my remarks there and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. question again we'd like you to speak to the mic so that we can get the question as well as the answer on our tape. Are the phenobar or the barbiturates used as an anesthetic? I mean much. The the uh, highly fat soluble ones are used as anesthetics. The two most common of these are thiopental or pentothal and a drug called brevitol. They, it's very interesting, uh, within one or two passages through the brain after introduction intravenously, uh, they diffuse into the lipids and out you go. They're very short acting, uh, brevitol probably 10 to 15 minutes and the patient's wide awake after a single dose. The longer ones uh, are not used for anesthesia. You mentioned that um, the addiction or physical dependence to the barbiturates was um, overemphasized. Are there any withdrawal symptoms associated with uh, physical withdrawal symptoms? Yes. And what are these? The uh, approximate, well, in less severity, the same as with the uh, narcotics, uh, except for the autonomic disturbances. I mean, the, the, the withdrawal from barbiturates is usually anxiety states and intense nervousness rather than the abdominal pain, uh, nausea, sweating, etc. Aren't they more dangerous in so, some cases, withdrawal from barbiturates than, say, narcotics as opium? More and not to my knowledge. You mentioned in your remarks that Demerol is the most abused drugs by doctors and nurses. Uh, I wonder why this is in view of the fact that all the drugs are available to them, and also I wonder if this might be due, uh, abuse could be from self-diagnosis and treatment? Um, well, the answer to your latter question, yes, the uh, self-diagnosis and treatment. Uh, of course, they say that the doctor who treats himself not only has a fool for a doctor, but a fool for a patient. But uh, the, it really is not known why doctors turn to Demerol unless it's for its quick action uh, and perhaps from the fact that uh, opium and morphine addicts have been around a lot longer and it maybe is socially not as acceptable. It is, a, it is interesting that the approximate average time between when a doctor becomes a hooked addict 
and the time that he is caught for his addiction is about seven years. So that during all this period of time, this fellow is able to uh, manipulate fairly well. Any other questions? How do drugs have Parkinson's disease? Amphetamines is the one I had in mind. Well, none of these um, amphetamines help the, help Parkinson's disease by their effect on what is called the extrapyramidal system. And Parkinson's disease is uh, concerned with this system, a group of areas in the brain that are quite complex that I wouldn't care to discuss. But these drugs are not the primary the therapeutic agents for Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, the back gets stiff. <clears throat> in Parkinson's disease, the back gets stiff, and I just wondered if this uh, uh, alleviated any of the stiffness, or what is the actual use of these drugs? Well, the, in Parkinson's disease, there are two things, the tremor and the spasticity, and we have drugs to take care of the spasticity much better than we do to take care of the tremor. But uh, uh, the muscle relaxants could. The phenothiazines can produce a state like Parkinson's disease, a severe state. And it's quite a striking state with what is called opisthotonous and peculiar motions and eye movements, so that they are contraindicated in anyone who has Parkinson's disease. In the normal therapeutic use of, of amphetamines for weight control, uh, how long does it take uh, or how long a trial of therapy before withdrawal symptoms are noticed and I wonder do you have any facts on how many uh, patients abuse amphetamines uh, in the weight control program? I'm sorry I don't have any figures about the number that abuse them. Um, the, length, I, the length of time for withdrawal symptoms to occur is really rather hard to ascertain. It's hard to find a People can um, get by with amphetamine usage much better than they can from um, barbiturates and things like this. This kind of hoops them up so that they're not as noticeable as the guy that's sitting around kind of dozing and drowsy. Um, as far as in the use for obesity, it takes about a month, three months at the most, to develop some tolerance to the effect of amphetamine on the appetite. So that after a month, uh, in double-blind studies, people who are given amphetamines and are given inert ingredients uh, have the same effect, approximately, in large studies. But um, I'm not, I don't know the answer to how, how long it takes to develop the tolerance that will, um, that will lead to withdrawal symptoms. I think this is quite variable. There are, um, I'm sure, thousands of patients who take amphetamine and never do get hooked. They can stop it and start it. And, you know, the people are always dieting. They'll go two, three months and get disgusted and just stop everything. So I think it takes a relatively long period of time for many individuals. Would you please repeat the advantages of drugs, the use of drugs? They, I got some of them. They, uh, you don't need much equipment. You use it for all ages, and there were three or four others. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to my notes. Well, so I don't I'm think. sorry, I didn't hear that. Right. Um, they they do not require equipment. Post-treatment complications are fewer. They're cheaper. They can be used in children and elderly. They may be given during the course of psychotherapy, their effects are generally reversible. And their, their, um, their use over a wide dosage range is quite valuable. Um, I had a slide to illustrate this, but uh, the usual dose of Thorazine is 50 to two or three hundred milligrams a day. It can be given in doses of ten to a thousand milligrams a day 
with relative safety. And this would not be true of morphine, which uh, the usual dose is 10 milligrams. And if you give 30 or 40 milligrams to a patient who's never had morphine before, you're apt to be in trouble. Or the patient is, at least. I am not uh, sure whether this question is quite appropriate at this time. But as the other day we were discussing after one of the conferences, and this seemed the best time to bring it up. Has there been any work or any type of research done with uh, your hallucinatory drugs, for example, LSD, as to uh, what effect this would have upon a blind person? Would they see something, or and if they did, did, did they see this just in their mind, or do they actually see colors, or? I don't know, maybe this is not the right time to... Well, I would, the only part of that question that I would know anything about would be in a blind person, it would obviously have to be an hallucination, which if they do not see it, they conjure the image up in the mind. Thank you. But I don't know any, I, I'm totally unversed in the hallucinogens, and I intend to stay that way, I think. <laughs> Um, and getting back to his question, I was wondering, when he talked about dependency on the amphetamines, would this depend more on the length of time that you, they were taken or the dosage that they were taken? I think it can depend on both of those circumstances, but mainly I believe that it depends more on the type of patient. I, I think uh, it takes a patient who would readily develop dependence on aspirin or anything else who, uh, physical dependence, the use of a pill, uh, whatever that means to the patient. Because uh, withdrawal symptoms just aren't seen. The patient, no, no, they're, they can be addictive. I mean, what would you consider the most contributing factor to dependency would be the length of time to Length of time and dosage, both. In dealing with the, the uh, uh, tranquilizers, you mentioned that they could be used with children and elderly. Uh, what um, particular preparation would be best for children? Well, most any of them. Thorazine uh, is, is a good preparation for children. Thorazine? Thorazine. Is that a form of chlorpromazine or not? That is chlorpromazine. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the trade name for chlorpromazine. Oh, yeah. uh, but also uh, uh, compazine, uh, stelazine, even librium uh, and uh, meprobamate have been used in children. Phenobarbital is still an excellent drug in children. And uh, the antihistamines that have a sedative effect such as Benadryl are useful as sedatives in children, too. Benadryl. Is there any abuse to the derivatives of cocaine, such as novocaine, lidocaine, and these? No, not to my knowledge. They're administered strictly as local anesthetics, with the exception of procaine and xylocaine, and these are now being used extensively in the treatment of the rhythm problems with uh, sick hearts. They're given directly intravenously for uh, the cardiac arrhythmias. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. We're sorry to have to wrap over this. He has to be first to Indianapolis and then to Denver, so uh, we can thank him for coming today. Uh,